something that's, you know, kind of bitchy. Pretty bitchy. Cool. Bitchy? I know. So it's just, you know, bitchy. <laughs> well, first of all, you're a little bitchy. That's, that's next level bitchy. Welcome to Bitchy History, the irreverent history podcast where one history professor gets to bitch about history and the impact it has on the world today. Welcome back to Bitchy History. Yes, we have a new intro again. Let me know what you think of it. I take constructive criticism no matter what my commenters on TikTok might claim to the contrary. This is the 33rd episode of this show. Can you believe that? I mean, it would be more, but teaching takes a lot of time when you actually give a shit about your students and the education they get from you. Go figure. But anyway, last week in my intro to American history class, I was lecturing on the Civil War and the self-emancipation thesis, which Civil War historian James McPherson describes this way in his article, Who Freed the Slaves? The self-emancipation thesis embodies an important truth. By coming into Union lines, by withdrawing their labor from Confederate owners, by working for the Union army and fighting as soldiers in it, slaves did play an active part in achieving their own freedom, and for that matter, in preserving the Union. Like workers, immigrants, women, and other so-called non-elites, the slaves were neither passive victims nor pawns of powerful white males who loom so large in our traditional image of the past. They, too, made a history that historians have finally discovered. This concept might seem a little deep for an intro-level American history class, but I always come prepared with historical illustrations on these more theoretical discussions of historical nuance. In the case of the self-emancipation thesis, my example is Harriet Tubman, and as ever, the blind spots in my students' previous education on American history hit me with full force as I was once more met with stares of shock from students who definitely didn't know Harriet the way I know her. One student on the way out of class actually stopped and told me that she'd had three classes where the Civil War was taught, and this was the first time she'd heard this information about Tubman, which is why today's episode is on this very information. Education on Harriet, at least for my students, seems to begin with her escape from slavery and end with the Underground Railroad, and those are, in themselves, admirable and heroic stories, but it's also not where her story ended. Born into slavery in 1822 in Maryland, Harriet was one of nine children. She escaped to the North in 1849. On a side note, because she was enslaved in Maryland, had she still been enslaved at the time of the war, she would not have been freed by the Emancipation Proclamation, which only freed slaves within states in rebellion against the United States. Maryland was one of four slave states, including Delaware, Kentucky, and Missouri, which did not secede from the Union. When you think about it, this is one of the more ridiculous parts of the Emancipation Proclamation. Lincoln's Secretary of State, William Seward, who would have a very close relationship with Harriet Tubman in the following years, sarcastically summed up the issue this way, We show our sympathy with slavery by emancipating slaves where we cannot reach them and holding them in bondage where we can set them free. But Harriet, like so many of the enslaved, didn't wait for the war. She escaped to freedom 13 years before the Emancipation Proclamation would tie the issue of slavery directly to the Union's cause for fighting. But Harriet wasn't satisfied with simply escaping slavery and starting her new life in Philadelphia. For the next several years, she would risk her life and freedom going back to Maryland at least 13 times to help guide other slaves, many of them her own friends and family, to freedom as a conductor for the Underground Railroad. All in all, she rescued around 70 people on those trips, though later numbers by her biographer, Sarah Bradford, would inflate those numbers to 19 trips and over 300 people. Of her work, it is said that Tubman had this to say, I was the conductor of the Underground Railroad for eight years, and I can say what most conductors can't say. I never ran my train off the track, and I never lost a passenger. John Brown and Harriet Tubman met for the first time in April of 1858 in St. Catharines, on the Canadian side of Niagara Falls. Brown, awestruck at meeting Tubman, dubbed her General Tubman and referred to her as one of the best and bravest persons on the planet. Abolitionist Wendell Phillips wrote, The last time I ever saw John Brown was under my own roof, as he brought Harriet Tubman to me, saying, Mr. Phillips, I bring you one of the best and bravest persons on this continent, General Tubman, as we call her. In 1859, Tubman would play a key role in helping Brown plan his famous but ill-fated raid on Harper's Ferry. She used her geographical knowledge of the Mid-Atlantic region and helped raise funds in Boston for the raid. Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry was a failure, but ultimately an important moment in building tensions between the North and South. Tubman said after Brown's death that he had done more in dying than a hundred men would in living. 
A count of 70 freed souls and her aid on the Harper's Ferry raid would be more than enough to give her general credentials in my book. But when the Civil War begins in 1860, her work on the Underground Railroad shifted into something that gave Brown's nickname for her even more literal a meaning. Her involvement with the Civil War started out in the more traditional role that women tended to play in military camps, as a nurse and a cook. In early 1862, Tubman traveled to South Carolina to provide badly needed nursing care for African-American soldiers and civilians. However, soon she also began serving as a spy and a scout behind Confederate lines. She recruited escaped slaves to act as river pilots, spies, and scouts as well. This group of spies were able to undermine the Confederates, liberate many enslaved African-Americans, and destroy goods and the property of plantation owners and the Confederate army as well. Dressed as a field hand, she led scouting and spying missions to identify and map the locations of Confederate mines, supply areas, and troops. Tubman delivered the information all to Union Colonel James Montgomery, commander of the 2nd South Carolina Volunteer Infantry, to support military operational planning. It was with Colonel Montgomery that one of the largest successes of Tubman's career came on June 1, 1863. This one mission destroyed millions of dollars of Confederate property, freed more than 700 slaves, and made Harriet Tubman the first woman to lead an armed military operation in the United States. This was the raid on the Combahee River Ferry. The Combahee River is a short river in the southern low country region of South Carolina. It bordered and supplied the water for some of the largest and most productive rice plantations in the state. Or it did until the Union soldiers torched them all with Harriet Tubman's help. Union Colonel James Montgomery was an abolitionist who really put his money where his mouth was on the topic. He was well known during the Civil War for liberating slaves during his raids, as well as burning and looting the goods and properties of the pro-slavery populations he encountered. Montgomery was authorized to raise a regiment of African-American infantry in January of 1863 that would become the 2nd South Carolina Volunteer Infantry Regiment, which would accompany Tubman and himself on this raid. June 2, 1863, at around 3 o'clock in the morning, two ships, the Harriet A. Weed and the USS John Adams, arrived at the mouth of the Combahee River at Fields Point. Small detachments of the 2nd South Carolina Regiment were sent to drive off Confederate soldiers, while the other two ships continued upriver to Nichols Plantation, where the gunboat Harriet A. Weed anchored. Carrying the remainder of the 2nd South Carolina Infantry and Tubman, the USS John Adams went upriver to the Combahee Ferry. Here I will read from Sarah Bradford's biography of Harriet Tubman. The word was passed that these were Lincoln's gunboats come to set them free. In vain, then, the drivers used their whips in their efforts to hurry the poor creatures back to their quarters. They all turned and ran for the gunboats. They came down every road, across every field, just as they had left their work and their cabins. Women with children clinging around their necks, hanging to their dresses, running behind, all making it full speed for Lincoln's gunboats. I never see such a sight, said Harriet. We laughed and laughed and laughed. Here you'd see a woman with a pail on her head, rice smoking in it, just as she'd taken it from the fire, young one hanging on behind, one around her forehead to hold on, another digging in the rice pot, eating while they ran. Hold of her dress, two or three more, down her back, a bag with a pig in it. One woman brought two pigs, a white one and a black one. We took them all on board, naming the white pig Beauregard and the black pig Jeff Davis. And so they came pouring down to the gunboats. When they stood on the shore and the small boats put out to take them off, they only wanted to get in at once. After the boats were crowded, they would hold on to them so they would not leave the shore. The oarsmen would beat them on their hands, but they would not let go. They were afraid the gunboats would go off and leave them and all wanted to make sure of one of these arcs of refuge. At length, Colonel Montgomery shouted from the upper deck above the clamor of appealing tones, "'Moses, you'll have to give him a song!' Then Harriet lifted up her voice and sang. The song Harriet sang, according to Bradford's biography, was a few bars of a popular Yankee song known as Uncle Sam's Farm, of which I am providing a recording because I'm sure as hell not going to try to sing it. Of all the mighty nations in the East or in the West, oh, this glorious Yankee nation is the greatest and the best. We have room for all creation, and our banner is unfurled. Here's a general invitation to the people of the world. Oh, come away, come away, come away, I say. Oh, come away, come away, come right away. Oh, come to this country and have no fear of harm. Our Uncle Sam is rich enough to give us all a farm. 
Somewhere between 700 to 800 slaves were freed on this one raid. Numbers differed slightly depending upon the source. In addition, houses and barns and railroad bridges were burned, railroad tracks were torn up, torpedoes destroyed, and many of the freed African Americans would join the Union Army as well. Of the raid, newspapers had quite a lot to say. For instance, in the pro-Union Commonwealth newspaper, they said, Colonel Montgomery and his gallant band of 300 black soldiers under the guidance of a black woman dashed into the enemy's country, struck a bold and effective blow, destroying millions of dollars worth of commissary stores, cotton, and lordly dwellings, and striking terror into the heart of rebeldom, brought off nearly 800 slaves and thousands of dollars worth of property, without losing a man or receiving a scratch. It was a glorious consummation. The colonel was followed by a speech from the black woman who led the raid and under whose inspiration it originated and conducted. For sound sense and real native eloquence, her address would do honor to any man, and it created a great sensation. That's pretty good coverage. I mean, it would have been nice if they had named the woman in question, but still, for its day, pretty progressive. The pro-Confederacy Charleston Mercury had a slightly different take, spending most of their article recounting all of the goods burned or looted and naming all of the poor, poor plantation owners who'd been wronged by the bad, bad union. You can tell how sympathetic I feel to their terrible plight. The raid was enormously successful, and the Union would go on to adopt the tactics used for future operations. The Combahee Ferry Raid proved the value of black troops in combat and demonstrated Harriet Tubman's intelligence and bravery. Reporting on the raid to Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, a Union general said this, This is the only military command in American history wherein a woman, black or white, led the raid and under whose inspiration it was originated and conducted. It's unfortunate that, despite her many years of service and incalculably beneficial work for the Union, Tubman would not be recognized for her military service ever during her lifetime. Many people worked to petition the government on her behalf, including Secretary of State William Seward, who Bradford said exerted himself in every possible way to procure her a pension. Bradford sums up the situation far more eloquently than I could. It is a shame to our government that such a valuable helper as this woman was not allowed pay or pension, but even was obliged to support herself during those days of incessant toil. Officers and men were paid. Indeed, many enlisted from no patriotic motive, but because they were insured a support which they could not procure for themselves at home. But this woman sacrificed everything and left her nearest and dearest and risked her life hundreds of times for the cause of the Union without one cent of recompense. She returned at last to her little home to find it a scene of desolation, her little place about to be sold to satisfy a mortgage, and herself without the means to redeem it. Bradford's biography of Tubman's life, published in 1869, would bring Tubman around $12,000 in funds, and many of her friends and supporters from the days of her abolition work would raise funds to support her as well. In 1874, Representatives Clinton McDougall of New York and Jerry Hazelton of Wisconsin introduced a bill to pay Tubman a $2,000 lump sum for services rendered by her to the Union Army as scout, nurse, and spy, but it was defeated in Senate. The Dependent and Disability Pension Act of 1890 made Tubman eligible for a pension after her second husband, Nelson Davis, a Civil War veteran, died of tuberculosis on October 14, 1888. In 1895, Tubman was granted a monthly widow's pension of $8 a month. In December of 1897, New York Congressman Sereno Payne introduced a bill to grant Tubman a soldier's monthly pension of $25 a month. Congress received documents and letters to report Tubman's claim on her work as a soldier, but despite the vouching of people like Brigadier General Rufus Saxton and others, some members objected to a woman being paid a full soldier's pension. Because of course they fucking did. One has to wonder how much any of them actually did during the war. One of the members of the committee who blocked Tubman's $25 pension was W. Jasper Talbert of South Carolina, so you can imagine his reasons for doing so. In February of 1899, Congress approved a compromise amount of $20 per month, which was actually $8 a month for the widow's pension and $12 for her service as a nurse, but they refused to acknowledge her service as a scout and a spy. And let's face it, a military officer. Surrounded by friends and family members, she died of pneumonia on March 10, 1913, was buried in a, with semi-military honors at a Fort Hill Cemetery in Auburn, New York, where she had lived with her family on land purchased from the Secretary of State Seward family in 1859. 
She never did what she did for the accolades, as far as I can tell, which is really why she deserved far better than what the country she fought for gave her. In 2023, the Army Surgeon General and Army Chaplain Corps hosted a ceremony in Washington to honor her, and earlier this year in Philadelphia, a statue of Tubman titled A Higher Power, The Call of a Freedom Fighter was approved by the Philadelphia Art Commission to be placed outside City Hall. Artist Alvin Petty said that it was inspired by this very raid on the Combahee Ferry and will be larger than life, standing 15 feet tall, a timely reminder of the struggles faced to truly make this country something approximating a land of the free. Because yes, Nikki Haley, there is systemic racism in America, and there always has been. I'll close here with a letter to Harriet written by Frederick Douglass. Most that I have done and suffered in the service of our cause has been in public, and I have received much encouragement at every step of the way. You, on the other hand, have labored in a private way. I have wrought it in the day, you in the night. I have had the applause of the crowd and the satisfaction that comes of being approved by the multitude, while the most that you have done has been witnessed by a few trembling, scarred, and footsore bondmen and women, whom you have led out of the house of bondage, and whose heartfelt God bless you has been your only reward. The midnight sky and the silent stars have been witnesses of your devotion to freedom and of your heroism. Much that you have done would seem improbable to those who do not know you as I know you. Your friend, Frederick Douglass. Thank you for tuning in to hear me bitch about history. If you're loving the show, don't forget to subscribe and make sure to visit bitchyhistory.com to sign up for the newsletter. The newsletter offers extra resources on the topics covered in all of our episodes, as well as on the topics covered in my videos on TikTok. Supporting the podcast is really easy. Spread the word to your friends, grab some fabulous bitchy history merch off our website, or consider becoming a paid subscriber. Your support means the world to us. History. 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 What a bitch, right? (laughs) 